Good morning and welcome to our West Hour webinars, the last Wednesday of every month. Um, today we're delighted to have Dr. John Lewis join us. Um, he's the CEO of Entos Pharmaceuticals as well as a professor at the University of Alberta. So we're really excited um, to present him as a guest speaker from industry. Um, his talk will be very um, revealing. So just a couple uh, housekeeping um, tips and tricks and introductions before we get started. So as always, we'd like to introduce our North America West team. Um, so we have Angel Galarza, who is the regional sales director for the Northwest. He's located in the Bay Area, along with his field application scientist, Ian Villamagna. And then, of course, my name is Kim Killian, and I'm the regional sales manager located in the Southwest, um, and I'm in San Diego, and I work very closely with my field application scientist, who you all know is Vian Vietwin. And just a reminder, we're all in the States, but our, our company is located in Vancouver. And I think that's everything. Oh, then just as a reminder, we encourage you to join us for our quarterly events. Um, our next uh, journal club is June 11th. It's always the second Friday of every month. We do have a, a time change. We always do it at 10 a.m. for our journal clubs, which is noon um, central time. And our webinars, as a reminder, are always 9 a.m. And our next one will be June 30th. And that will be pres uh, presented by Dr. Justin Richner from the U University of Illinois College of Medicine. So I think that's everything. Um, we do have our West Hour on YouTube and you can check out all the prior videos um, if you wanna catch up. And this one too will be on the YouTube West Hour channel after the presentation today. So again, the West Hour is webinars empowering science and technology. Thanks again for your attendance and participation, and we look forward to your questions after. So, John, it's all yours now. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Kim, and and to Precision Nano and the whole Precision Nano team for for inviting me to to share our journey. Uh, at Entos Pharmaceuticals and Aegis Life and the development of a, a, a DNA vaccine for COVID-19 based on our Fusagenics platform. Uh, so as Kim mentioned, I'm the CEO of Entos Pharmaceuticals, also a professor at the University of Alberta in oncology, uh, not a trained vaccinologist, I'll put that right up front, but uh, but certainly, you know, in the cancer field, we, we uh, we have a lot of experience with immunology, and so it's been quite the journey. Entos Pharmaceuticals was founded in, in 2016. Uh, it's an, a Canadian uh, company based in Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, we have uh, R&D facilities and, uh, and uh, offices both in Edmonton, Alberta, uh, and we're in the Merck Invention Accelerator there as well. Uh, we also uh, have labs and offices in San Diego. We're in, in J Labs uh, in, in the Innovation Center uh, in San Diego. Uh, and we have clinical manufacturing, uh, GMP manufacturing sites uh, in Edmonton, Alberta as well. So Antos Pharmaceuticals is a genetic medicines company. And, and you know, we, we're at sort of at a precipice, I think, of, of huge change. And, and so we're sort of daring to imagine a world without genetic disease. And, and, uh, and I'll make the argument that pretty much every disease is, is a genetic disease. I think, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, especially brought on by the success of the RNA vaccines, for instance, a really a new reality in genetic medicine. And we've, we've had the sequence to the human, human genome now for, for two decades, uh, but the tools to be able to treat diseases based on that information uh, have been, you know, have been more slow to develop, but I think we're at this point now where we can you know, increase the level of gene uh, expression. We can decrease the level of gene expression. We can even edit genes. We can we can edit single nucleotides and genes. And I think so. The opportunities to to be able to cure a wide variety of diseases uh, and infectious diseases that plague humankind are really at our fingertips. And and uh, and really, what we need the sort of the key enabler of this are are, are safe, effective, and redosable nucleic acid delivery technologies. So Entos is a platform. Um, technology company that has a genetic medicines delivery technology. 
And, uh, and, and as I mentioned, these delivery platforms are the key enablers of broad application of genetic medicines. So currently, and, and the COVID pandemic has really brought this to the fore and really educated the, the general public, uh, you know, to be able to deliver tools that can modify gene, genetic behavior or gene expression behavior are really based on two main platforms, viral and non-viral. So we've seen, you know, the rise and, and success of viral vectors uh, in the gene therapy space. These are uh, adeno-associated virus and other viruses like lentivirus. Uh, in, in the vaccine space, there are adenovirus. Uh, and there are many other viral platforms that are, that are at the R&D and, and clinical phase as well. And so viral vectors, you know, have evolved for millions of years to be able to effectively deliver genetic material. Uh, we have approved gene therapies and vaccines now based on viral vectors. And really, they're, they're, I would say their biggest challenge, uh, you know, beyond manufacturing challenges, which have been um, solved to some degree, um, redosing is really the real challenge with viral vectors. You know, because you're delivering uh, an entire viral capsid, uh, this, this is immunogenic and generates its own immune response, making redosing, you know, uh, challenging. Although there are, you know, technologies to, to, to mitigate this somewhat, it's really the, the major challenge of viral vectors is redosing. On the other hand, we have the non-viral platforms, and there are many of them. Uh, but I would say that the most successful furthest along are lipid nanoparticles, and and so you know uh, companies like uh, you know Canadian company Tecmira, and uh, and then and then you know brought on by companies like Alnylam and now Moderna and and Pfizer, BioNTech, and CureVac, uh, have really pushed the this uh, lipid nanoparticle technology to the fore. And now we have you know, we have approved systemic therapies, we have approved vaccines, and uh, and and really you know have really broke open this uh, this age now of genetic medicines. Uh, but lipid nanoparticles uh, you know have their drawbacks as well. So. Um, so the, you know, the current formulations, when they're systemically dosed, have tolerability challenges. Uh, biodistribution is a, you know, a challenge for all nanoparticle platforms. And so, but I think, you know, the, the message I'd like to, to give is that, you know, with the success of these genetic medicines against COVID, uh, you know, gen these genetic approaches, you know, to the surprise of some, I would say maybe not all of us, uh, have made the world's most effective vaccines. Super exciting, you know, an amazing triumph for innovation uh, uh, around the world. Uh, but I would say this is really only the beginning. And so at Entos, uh, you know, we've been uh, we've been thinking about genetic delivery for many years, uh, mainly focused on oncology. But uh, in our case, you know, we thought, what if we could we love the lip, you know, the non-viral lipid nanoparticle platform. But what if we could sort of bring the the best of both viral and non-viral platforms together? And so, you know, this is uh, uh, this is sort of an overview slide of what lipid nanoparticles are. They're generally a mix of three to five lipids. Uh, but really, the key component of a lipid nanoparticle are the cationic or ionizable lipids. So, so when you deliver, you know, nanoparticles either locally or systemically, uh, they're taken up by endocytosis by a variety of different cells. And so in the endosome, an ionizable lipid uh, will, will basically go from uh, neutral uh, to, to acquiring a positive charge. These positive charges will change their structures and allow them to disrupt the membrane of the endosome and, 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 and uh, facilitate endosomal escape. And so this has proved to be extremely effective and lipid nanoparticles do a, you know, a great job of delivering cargos like siRNA and RNA, um, but they do have their challenges as I mentioned. So, so this disruptive effect of positive charge uh, in uptake organs, particularly after systemic administration uh, can confer dose limiting toxicities. And so, so at Entos, we've been working for many years with technologies that will allow us to uh, basically perform the delivery using a mechanism that is not related to an ionizable lipid. And so, and we look to viruses for that. So co-founder, um, Professor Roy Duncan, he's a professor at the you know, or at Dalhousie University. Uh, uh, almost two decades ago now, he discovered this class of fusogenic orthoreovirus that uh, does something really interesting. So orthoreoviruses do not infect humans, uh, but they infect things like birds and alligators and, and, and some primates. And what he discovered was that um, some of these orthoreoviruses, when they infect cells, cause all the cells around them to rapidly fuse together. And so he realized back then that he discovered a novel fusion protein, but what he didn't realize until some time later is how unique it was. 
So many viruses uh, use fusion proteins to either get entry to cells or to promote their virulence. And I'm showing, you know, the flu HA protein, which is well known here. You know, it has three transmembrane domains. It has it's a multi subunit structure, uh, and it's pretty big, right? It's huge. And so you'd imagine this is highly immunogenic and probably pretty much impossible to manufacture. What Roy found is that these fusogenic orthoreoviruses expressed what he called a fusion-associated small transmembrane protein. Emphasis on the small. These are really tiny proteins. Single transmembrane domain, really tiny ectodomain, just a dozen or so amino acids. But most importantly, mechanistically, these proteins are sufficient to induce membrane-to-membrane -membrane fusion. And so Roy, uh, and I guess the, the second point is if, if uh, when he formulated these into liposomes or lipid nanoparticles, they facilitate direct fusion of that nanoparticle with the plasma membrane of cells, you know, completely avoiding endosomal uptake and escape and depositing the cargo directly in the cytoplasm. And Roy spent you know, the better part of his career discovering and characterizing the fusion associated small transmembrane proteins from different uh, uh, hosts, so um, six in total. Uh, and each one is slightly different. So, you know, he spent a lot of time doing structure function analysis of these proteins, trying to figure out which which domains were were critical for fusion. Uh, and so, and together we have uh, um, been able to iterate these proteins uh, to come up with fully synthetic version. I'll just give you sort of an example of the kinds of studies we've done. So again, here's the uh, structure of a, a fusion associated small transmembrane protein. It's mostly transmembrane domain, small ectodomain, typically uh, fixed into the membrane with a uh, meristillation at the end terminus. Uh, it, it may or may not have a, a sort of a, a positively charged domain at the C-terminus that anchors it onto the membrane. And, uh, and then a C-terminal domain that's typically used for, for other viral factors and binding proteins. And so, for instance, when we looked at the function of, uh, of the reptilian uh, host P14 uh, and the primate host P15, uh, and we basically mixed and matched their different domains together to look at activity, in this case, in a quail muscle cell syncytia assay. So you can see when we put P14 on these cells, uh, you get these multinucleate syncytia. And so by counting those, we get a rough quantitative estimate of their fusion uh, activity. And, and what Roy found was that, you know, many of the combinations of domains uh, still were active in the fusion assay. Uh, several of them had absolutely no fusion activity. So in particular, when you use the ectodomain of P15 and the endodomain of P14, we lost the activity. Uh, but one particular case, uh, the ectodomain of P14 and the endodomain of P15 actually produced activity that was higher than either of the parent fusion molecules. So we've been working to iterate these, uh, these fusion proteins to create a fully synthetic manufacturable a fusion associated small transmembrane protein that we incorporate in Entos's fusogenics platform. And so that brings us to today. Uh, so that's on the science side. We've been you know, iterating the technology around fusion proteins. Uh, another obviously very important part of it is, is you know, how do we put all of these together into a functional uh, um, uh, nanoparticle? And so we're utilizing uh, uh, you know, microfluidics in the, in the precision nanosystems microfluidic platform to be able to integrate uh, you know, this fusion protein, a mix of lipids and the cargo in a single step, uh, you know, really to come out the other side of this microfluidic uh, process, you know, fully formed 99.8%. And so we've, uh, we've dubbed it a proteolipid vehicle uh, because it contains lipids, proteins, and cargo. And what incorporating the, the fast, so the fast protein is now doing the heavy lifting of the delivery. And so that's allowed us to be a lot more flexible on the lipid content. We've been able to, uh, we've, you know, removed the, the, the ionizable lipid uh, for the most part uh, and, uh, and uh, alter the other lipids so that they're, you know, naturally occurring, uh, very, very well tolerated lipids. So we've optimized, you know, this platform to be extremely well tolerated, particularly for systemic administration and for the encapsulation of a variety of different cargos, including siRNA, RNA, plasma DNA, even our, you know, RNP and guide RNA for gene editing. And there's really no limit on the size of things you can put inside this platform when you when you manufacture using microfluidics, uh, you know, large plasmid 16 KB or, or larger are, you know, are, are very effective. 
And, and again, you know, we, we've been working with precision nanosystems now for many years. Uh, you know, we, uh, it's really been a boon to our uh, R&D facilities to be able to, you know, to pilot and, and prototype things at the bench top and then move them, you know, up through their instruments, through the nano assembler and the blaze to do, you know, larger in vivo studies, primate studies, and, and then clinical studies. And so, um, so we're working very closely with a GMP manufacturing facility in Edmonton, the Alberta Cell Therapy Manufacturing Center. Uh, you know, this is a you know fantastic uh, center, multiple clean rooms. Uh, we have the precision nanosystems uh, CGMP setup uh, in that a manufacturing material, and uh, and this is making the clinical material for our current clinical trials for for the COVID nineteen vaccine. So I'll just quickly go over. So now we have this, you know, this uh, this non-viral platform made up of lipids, lipids and fast protein, where we've, uh, you know, uh, where we've been able to uh, dramatically change the lipid profile so that uh, so they're extremely tolerable, but now can deliver things like DNA. So I'm showing you here uh, on human fibroblasts. If you use the formulation without the fusion protein, so if we, variety of human primary cell lines, so we've got fibroblasts, uh, hepatocytes, astrocytes, uh, endothelial cells, and a cancer cell line. You know this formulation uh, encapsulating a GFP expressing DNA uh, on these cells basically uh, is very weakly uh, active. We incorporate the fast protein in this formulation. Again, we get really nice sized particles. So again, in the 50 to 60 nanometer range, good polydispersity. Uh, but then we, we really activate the transfection activity of these. So really great you know, uh, transfection delivery of, of plasma DNA to a wide variety of primary cell lines. Um, it works just as well with RNA. So in this case, delivering uh, an RNA encoding a red fluorescent protein M cherry uh, in a variety of different cell lines, uh, uh, retinal epithelial cells and 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 uh, fibroblasts and other cells. Uh, you know, we get inclusion of the fast protein in this highly tolerated formulation gives really dramatic transfection activity. And, and we can get creative. So again, we were, we're manufacturing using microfluidics. So there's no reason why we can't put multiple species in a single formulation. In this case, we can co-deliver a plasma DNA expressing GFP and an RNA in, in, encapsulating M cherry. This provides you know, some really interesting flexibility and creativity around the creation of therapeutics of vaccines. And the, you know, the other thing that we've optimized for is stability. So um, a highly stable formulation. Uh, we've, and we've removed some of the components that, that typically target LNP, conventional LMPs to organs like the liver. And so for instance, with, uh, with the, the plasma DNA formulation, encoding a gene expressing luciferase uh, in whole animal imaging injected systemically, we get good biodistribution to pretty much every organ after intravenous injection. Uh, you know, a local injection like we're doing with our first vaccine candidates, we're getting, you know, really strong uh, localized expression in the muscle uh, in mice. And what's really interesting in an area of active development is oral delivery. So we're, we're able, when we deliver plasma DNA encoding luciferase orally, uh, we, you know, at, at reason of very reasonable doses, uh, we see, you know, really robust expression, you know, visualized from outside the animal, obviously, uh, throughout the GI tract. And so it's an active area of development for us to develop oral formulations of our injectable uh, vaccines and therapeutics. And, and, you know, sort of prefacing how we developed, a, you know, how and why we developed a DNA vaccine. Uh, it was really around, you know, obviously DNA is more stable than RNA, but the other thing uh, you might not fully appreciate is DNA expresses its uh, target gene or its antigens with very different kinetics than RNA. So RNA will typically express a very, very high level for, for a few days, you know, less than a week. Uh, DNA ramps up in our case, you know, with the plasma we've selected, um, expresses, you know, ramps up expression over two months. And so we see we're really showing the immune system uh, constitutive uh, amounts of antigenic protein. And so this gives, you know, what we, what we sort of dub as a built-in booster. So we think that, you know, our vaccine would be effective after a single shot. And there's this other sort of, uh, uh, you know, thing that we think happens as well is, uh, you know, showing the, the immune system uh, antigen over a period of time uh, seems to lead to affinity maturation of the response. And so we're seeing a dramatic uh, increase in the affinity of neutralizing antibodies, for instance, over time, when we, get, when we achieve these expression kinetics that we can do with DNA. So one thing that's, that's really critical, obviously for a vaccine, you want immunogenicity, but you don't necessarily want immunogenicity against your delivery system. 
And so, and thinking about other applications such as gene therapies and, and redosing enzyme replacement, et cetera, uh, you know, it's really key to have redosing. The fast protein is a viral protein, although um, humans are not the host range. So it's really, uh, but surprisingly, completely non-immunogenic. It's a very small protein, it's very lipophilic. And so, and, and we demonstrate that here when we deliver uh, a luciferase encoding RNA uh, uh, intramuscularly, uh, basically every month for six months. And what we see actually surprisingly is that the expression of the mRNA goes up slightly. So we don't see any obvious neutralizing activity. And then when we take a look at the antibodies produced in the mice against either the fast protein, so whether we deliver it intravenously or intramuscularly, we see basically no induction or very low induction of anti-fast protein antibody levels. Uh, what's interesting though is when we deliver a, a luciferase RNA, for instance, we see a, you know, a substantial induction of anti-cargo antibodies, which is obviously key for creating an effective vaccine. So now I'll segue into to our vaccine program. So um, just to put it in perspective, you know, March or February, March 2020, uh, Entos Pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, working with some two dozen partners around the world, developing, developing, you know, with some vaccine programs, developing, uh, you know, gene therapies for rare diseases, developing uh, internally very, very interested in oncology, uh, intending to go in a first in human clinical trial uh, at the Cross Cancer Institute in Edmonton, Alberta, with, uh, with a gene therapy against solid tumors, get some great preclinical data, we're very excited about it. When the pandemic hit, uh, we were, you know, we're obviously faced with the delay in the program and the shutdown of research facilities. Uh, but we're, we'd also spent a lot of time optimizing our platform to deliver DNA in a very safe and effective way. And, and the base of the team, you know, got together and said, look, you know, we, we, we think these genetic vaccines are going to be effective, successful. And, uh, and what the world might need is an effective DNA vaccine that can be administered at similar doses, but fridge stable single dose. And so we've been working pretty much since then night and day uh, on a COVID-19 vaccine. So we're, you know, we're faced, in, uh, we're, we're, we're backtracking here, but we're faced, you know, with this unprecedented pandemic, we've seen 25,000 Canadian deaths already. Traditional vaccines, you know, we're looking at, this is optimistic, five to seven years, the average is well over 10 years, and we'd failed to make vaccines against the previous uh, SARS virus. Um, but what's really changed in the interim, you know, between SARS-1 and SARS-2 are these innovative new genetic technologies that have now allowed us and, you know, and, and us being, you know, Moderna, Pfizer and others to develop effective vaccines in a record time. And so, you know, thinking about the application of a genetic vaccine uh, to SARS-CoV-2, I think is really important because, uh, because it mirrors very well the SARS-CoV-2 infection cycle. So, so you know, the SARS-CoV-2, uh, an RNA virus that gains, you know, uh, uh, intercellular entry through interaction of its spike protein displayed on the surface with the ACE2 receptor facilitated by Tempris, you know, it, it gets uh, 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 endocytose into the cell, you know, produces the viral proteins, uh, copies of itself that are then released out of the cell membrane. So I, the key point here is that the virus is continuously cycling in and out of cells. And so, you know, we, you know, we and, and many others feel that, uh, we, you know, a coordinated multi-pronged immune response is critical for protection against, you know, many, many uh, uh, pathogens, including COVID-19. Uh, and really there's two arms of the immune system that are key for protection. Uh, the production of very specific antibodies mediated by, uh, by B cells. Uh, and these antibodies can either be non-neutralizing or neutralizing. The neutralizing antibodies are key because they block uh, the binding of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 to the ACE2 receptor, uh, preventing you know, very early that, that infectious cycle. So, you know, powerful neutralizing activity through antibodies, protects against viral entry, and, but there's questions. So we, we don't know how long the neutralizing titers or, or levels uh, stick around. And potentially, and we're seeing this with some vaccines, you know, neutralizing titers can be vulnerable to these viral escape mutants, these variants that, that have uh, changes in the spike protein that facilitate escape from neutralization.
So the other arm of the immune system is the, 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 the cell-based immunity mediated mainly uh, by T cells. And so these are trained cytotoxic C T cells that recognize SARS-CoV-2 infected cells uh, and, and kill them. So the, you know, T cells are, can provide very, very long lasting responses. You know, we have SARS-1 infected uh, individuals who recovered that still have circulating T cells. And T cells recognize different epitopes than, than B cells and, and antibodies. So, uh, you know, real big potential to target conserved pan coronavirus epitopes, you know, non, you know the non neutralizing epitopes and, and epitopes that are highly conserved in, in the other proteins other than spike in the coronavirus. Uh, you know, the issue with T cells is that they, they, it, they don't protect against the initial infection. So, uh, so I think we've seen this incredible success with, through genetic vaccines because of this. They're able to, you know, we deliver the genetic material. Uh, they express the, the antigens inside the cells. Some of these are processed and, and displayed on MHC for training of T cells. Some of these are, are, are secreted, released, uh, taken up by antigen presenting cells and, and to create neutralizing antibody responses. And so, um, so we get sort of, we, we potentiate both sides of the immune system, but, you know, genetic vaccines, uh, also allow us to do some interesting things like incorporate adjuvants genetically. And in our case, we've incorporated two adjuvants in our vaccine, an agonist, a rig eye agonist, uh, and a double-stranded RNA CPG agonist uh, to potentiate you know, this, this key response. And so at the beginning of that last year, uh, so Antos Pharmaceuticals, but also my academic lab working with uh, labs and companies across Canada and, and throughout the world, uh, basically put together this multidisciplinary team to develop a DNA vaccine against COVID-19. And so we've really been working night and day since then uh, on this project. And, and our idea then, you know, to differentiate ourselves from the RNA vaccines, to create a DNA vaccine that's stable in the fridge for one year, room temperature for a month, ideally single dose, uh, given the expression kinetics of plasma DNA, to produce a durable T cell response that should not only, you know, again, be durable uh, over many years, uh, produce the right kind of biased T cell response to, to be effective uh, uh, against not only, you know, the Wuhan strain of the virus, but, uh, but any emerging variants. And again, we have two candidates, and I'll get into that in a second, but there's a potential through a DNA vaccine to produce a pan-coronavirus candidate that I'll get into. And then we have, you know, this fantastic manufacturing capability through our partnership precision nanosystems to really scale up to the doses we need uh, to beat this pandemic. So we, we iterated through about two dozen different DNA vaccines and selected last June uh, two candidates to advance to clinical development, VAC001 and VAC002. VAC001 encodes the full length spike protein. So very, very similar to, to the approved vaccines out there. Uh, full length uh, spike uh, encoded in a, you know, a minimal plasma, the nanoplasma, Nature Technologies nanoplasma. And then, as I said, encoding also two uh, potent adjuvants to potentiate the response. And again, we, we know that uh, spike protein antigen works and can provide the basis of an effective vaccine. But we also uh, were able to, through our partnership with Epivax, uh, uh, create an AI developed uh, optimized epitope string of 34 epitopes that include spike, but also envelope and membrane proteins uh, epitopes. And these are, you know, designed specifically to generate a potent T cell durable response, again, encoded in the nanoplasmid with the adjuvants. And so, we, you know, we think this one is the pan coronavirus booster to end all boosters should be effective with a single dose. And so we've got a lot of preclinical data to support, you know, uh, the fact that we've got a potent T cell vaccine. So when we immunize uh, mice and look at T cell response stimulated, and again, this is with VAC001 looking at uh, T cell response, we get a really potent and specific anti-spike T cell response. Uh, we're getting a population of very uh, specific CD8 killer T cells that are reacting uh, to uh, in an antigen specific way. They're, they're extreme, you know, they're producing, this population is producing very, very high, significantly higher levels of interferon gamma, indicating that they're, uh, that they're active toward the, the, the spike protein. And that these are also, also six CD69 positive cells. So these are actively engaging and killing uh, target cells. Uh, I believe we're one of the first in the world to develop a functional T cell killing assay. So again, working with Roy Duncan's lab, we've developed an assay where we express 
um, spike protein on target cells. We take T cells from immunized mice and evaluate the ability of those T cells to, to engage and kill those spike specific cells. We see a nice dose dependent increase in the ability of those T cells to kill target cells. So again, we've, we're convinced we have a very potent and uh, an effective T cell vaccine. Uh, but importantly, we also produce a, a strong uh, antibody response. So in preclinical models, dosing at a variety of different dose levels, and I'll mention, you know, we, there are other DNA vaccines uh, in development, and OVO is probably the most uh, common or commonly known one. And, uh, you know, but there, you know, DNA vaccines typically uh, delivered through electroporation or other means are given at very high doses, two milligrams in some cases. We're able to get a you know, seroconversion in every single animal as low as 25 microgram doses uh, with both VAC001 and VAC002. If we look at the neutralizing response in a pseudovirus neutralization assay against either the original Wuhan strain or, or the most common variant, uh, we see very potent induction of neutralizing antibodies at every dose, you know, similar or, or uh, uh, increased over a panel of uh, human convalescent patients. Uh, again, even actually more potent neutralization activity uh, in the variants compared to the original strain. And this is really, really interesting. So we, we asked the question in primates uh, after either a single dose or two doses given one month apart, we assess their neutralization, uh, the, the stimulation of a neutralizing antibody titers over time. And we actually saw potent induction of neutralizing antibodies well above the protection threshold. And really the single dose and the two dose regimens virtually identical. So we're, we have a good level of confidence that it's the single dose DNA vaccine will be effective in protecting against COVID-19. We've done, uh, and we've seen this protection in animal models as well. So in, in a hamster challenge model, uh, performed at Vito Intervac in Saskatchewan. Uh, we, we asked, uh, we assessed whether either a single dose or two doses uh, were protective against challenge with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we're showing here the, the uh, basically differences in, in the weights when the hamsters are challenged with the virus after immunization. Uh, so, so hamsters lose a significant amount of weight uh, if they're not protected. This is uh, very, very well correlated with viral load. And we see a substantial reduction in weight loss uh, whether we give those hamsters a single dose or two doses, the two dose regimen is slightly more effective, but really in the end had, had pretty much the same result. And the max significant, you know, reduction or changes in maximal weight loss as well, either with the single or two dose regimen. And as I said, this typically is, is uh, correlates well with viral load. And so when we looked at uh, uh, upper respiratory tract uh, measures of viral shedding, we saw substantial uh, 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 reductions in, uh, in viral shedding uh, in the nasal turbinates. And we also saw, when we looked in the lungs, uh, we saw substantial reductions in viral load, two to three log reductions in viral load in the lung as well in the, in the immunized animals. So, um, so based on all of this uh, uh, compelling preclinical data, we've moved VAC001 and then VAC002 uh, to clinical development. We're currently running uh, a phase one, phase two trial uh, with uh, Scott Halperin as a PI at the Canadian Center for Vaccinology. Uh, we are sort of deep into the phase one uh, part now. And in phase one, uh, we're giving two dose levels, 100 micrograms and 250 micrograms. Uh, we're enrolling both a cohort of healthy adults and elderly patients or, or uh, volunteers. And, uh, and based on the safety in phase one, uh, we'll be expanding into a phase two trial. We'll expand up to 500 participants, looking again, the two dose levels, 100 and 250 micrograms, uh, but then looking at immuno uh, immunogenicity after either a single dose or two doses, similar to what we did in the primate studies. And based on that, uh, you know, we're in a highly dynamic uh, environment right now. Uh, we're, we're, you know, approved vaccines are becoming uh, available but mainly in first world countries. So in, we're looking probably our phase three strategy will be looking at probably both a primary immunization strategy where we'll do a placebo controlled uh, trial, uh, but obviously not in North America. Uh, and then also looking at doing uh, booster trials uh, probably in North America, uh, you know, looking at uh, uh, boosting individuals who received a, uh, previously received an approved vaccine, uh, likely with VAC002. Um, to look at the, the ability to protect, you know, uh, broadly against coronaviruses and, and all the variants. 
And so end that there, I'm sure there's a lot of questions. I would say, you know, uh, it's been a very, very tough year for, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, uh, North America, I think we're, we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but worldwide, you know, we're just starting to scratch the surface. You know, this is really not a, you know, a race, but more of a marathon. We're looking at, at, you know, vaccinating the world population over, you know, some four to five years. And so we need, you know, billions and billions of doses are needed worldwide. And, uh, and it's going to be really challenging to, you know, to get these doses to, to, to rural areas uh, and, and in clinics, uh, you know, where, you know, it's going to be very difficult to maintain a, a cold chain that requires, you know, deep cold, for instance. So, and we're also looking at a world with so many individuals around the world uh, infected. Uh, you know, this virus is getting, a, you know, lots of opportunity to adapt. And so I think we'll see, you know, uh, continuous emergence of novel variants. And so I think there's a pretty good chance that, uh, that you know, just like the flu, uh, uh, COVID-19 will become endemic and, and will require yearly boosters. This may be given with a flu shot. And so I think it's really key. You know, we have a made in Canada vaccine. You know, although we're looking forward now, given the timing and the availability of approved vaccines, you know, we, we could probably provide a booster, you know, uh, provide a made in Canada opportunity to provide boosters to Canadians. But I think, you know, the, the requirement worldwide to distribute the vaccine is still extremely strong. Uh, in the broader context, you know, uh, the, you know, we've been able to bring this Fusagenics platform, uh, you know, very, very rapidly. So in less than a year, all the way from concept to clinical trials. I think, you know, this has been a really big uh, uh, success, not only for genetic approaches, but, for, but in, in our case for a DNA based approach. Uh, and this really opens the door to many, many, many other applications of the Fusagenics technology. We can now essentially write biological software to cure or prevent disease. And we're very excited about, uh, about uh, you know, developing other vaccines, developing other therapeutics. Uh, you know, uh, both internally and with our, with our partners. I think uh, looking forward that really no disease is out of our reach and, and, uh, and there are, you know, some fantastic other companies in this space, uh, you know, working with the same vision in mind. So uh, thank you so much for attention. Obviously there's a huge team uh, that, that contributed to all of this. Uh, been working very, very, very hard over the past year. Uh, we're continuing to work hard as we bring our vaccines through clinical trials and, and hopefully eventually to emergency youth authorization. Uh, really appreciate your attention and your support. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Really appreciate that uh, fantastic talk and really exciting work. Always appreciate uh, seeing you guys present on this and, and hearing about what you're doing. Great talk. As always, we really appreciate your time. And um, we just encourage everyone, if this is your first webinar, to join us next month. It's always the last Wednesday of the month. And uh, hopefully we'll see you June 11th, which is our journal club on Fridays from 10 to 11 Pacific time. So I hope everyone's gearing up for a long Memorial Day weekend. Stay safe and please reach out to us if we can assist you with your research goals. Thanks, have a great day.